Uh, hi, uh, we're going to be talking about how you can use Google Search Trends to estimate global patterns in learning. Uh, Sir Hot's been giving most of the presentation. I'll just get us going. Uh, and we were also working on this with Motowari, a great collaborator. Okay, uh, and just as a motivating question, we put in so much effort into doing uh, progress in learning at scale. And I, I wonder this, and I'm sure you guys all wonder this, are we having impact? Like how much are we moving the needle? We all want to move the needle, we want more people to have access, but are we getting there? Uh, I feel like we are, but it'd be nice if we could say something a little bit more concrete. So this is what Sir Hot and I were really interested in. There are some ways to answer this question. There's people like PISA and they do global tests and they'll test a whole bunch of different countries every three years, but it's, it doesn't really tell you like how we move the needle on something like computer science. And that's for a bunch of reasons. It's only every three years. They don't test computer science. They just test things like numeracy and literacy. Uh, most of the world is left out. In blue, you can see the countries that are tested and in white, you can see all the countries that are not included. It's only for 15 year olds and it's only an emphasis on formal learning. It's a great thing. It's just not telling us the full picture of if we're moving the needle. So it'd be great if we had something a little bit better. And the insight that Sir Hot and I were working off of is there are billions of searches every day. There's basically one search per person on the planet every day and that's noisy signal, but is there something we can do to take this noisy signal and learn about who is learning? Because so much of our learning is being taken online. Google has exposed to Sir Hot and I, and all of you, a really interesting trend. So if you go to Google and you say like, hey, can you tell me how, how much people are learning about Bayes' theorem? They can give you temporal trends and, and you can really start to see the education. You know, if you look at when people are not learning Bayes' theorem, it's during the summer break and the winter break uh, or, or during the beginning of the COVID pandemic. It also tells you where people are searching for these concepts. You know, uh, null pointers search a lot in the US and India, whereas greenhouse gas is search a lot more uh, close to the equator. And so maybe there's something here, right? You know, and, and of course, it's not just those few examples. All these different search topics you look into, it just feels like there's some beautiful, beautiful, interesting data on who is learning and how learning is changing around the world. Clearly messy, but inspiring. Uh, we're not the first people to think about using Google Trends data to do interesting things. There's this very important study of how Google was using trends to predict the flu. You know, people would search for their symptoms and then they could figure out uh, who had big symptoms. Uh, it was used for seven years, but importantly, it did over predict and it had lots of uh, important biases. So we're going to go into this project really excited about the potential, but also really cautious about, you know, there could be some interesting structural uh, differences between countries. So I really turned to Sir Hot and I said, hey, Sir Hot, I've got this cool challenge for you. We've got this noisy, unsupervised mess of data from Google search to gain insights into learning. Uh, and he, he really took that to town. We set up a little bit of a theory just to get you guys going and the full details are in the paper. But basically we said, you know, while we would like to know the full distribution of people's literacy, how much they know computer science, really we can only talk about the average because of the data we have access to. And we got into it theoretically. We're like, okay, if you talk about the average knowledge of somebody in a region, you can use the total law of probability to split that up between people who have access to search and people who don't. And we start to make a few assumptions. First, we assume for computer science, if you don't have access to the internet, your expectation of computer science literacy is close to zero, and that's an assumption. Uh, and we made a second assumption that search depth is a proxy for literacy. And that's a really interesting assumption that we get very deep into the paper. Uh, long story short, we believe this makes sense for engineering. There's lots of research to suggest that when engineers are solving problems and learning, they do use inquiry. Whereas for other disciplines, it might not make so much sense. But long story short, we thought, hey, actually we do have a nice theoretical basis for saying, if we can figure out how much search volume there is, we can figure out how much people are literate in computer science. Uh, and of course, we call this a pseudo index because you know, we're just doing our best here to see what sort of signals we come back up with. And we want everyone to know that there's some real important assumptions and confounds to keep in mind. Okay, so Sir Hot, how could we use all this messy unsupervised data to measure depth of computer science literacy? All right, uh, thanks Chris. So we propose a computer science literacy proxy index, which uses uh, the search data in the internet uh, to estimate the average computer science literacy around the world. Um, so for that, I will explain it in three stages. The first one will be exporting data from Google Trends, and the second one will be the processing method that we use to minimize our estimation error. And at the end, we generate score for every country uh, that represents uh, the per capita CS literacy in that country. So let's first start with how we import that data. 
uh, from Google Trends. Google Trends is uh, allowing us to use two particular types of data that we are interested in. The first one is the interest by region, um, which allows us to see the popularity of a particular topic uh, compared to different regions in the world. So here by topic, I mean the set of all queries in all languages that are related to each other for that topic. And the second type of data that we're going to use is the compared breakdown by region, which allows us to see the relative popularities of multiple topics within the same region. So we are able to compare topics as well. Uh, okay, now we have the data. Let's see how we process it. Um, we take internet as a black box system at this point, which takes, um, okay, which takes computer science literacy as input and produces popularity for topics as the output. So thanks to the Google Trends data we have, we are able to calculate those uh, popularity for topic, uh, topic popularities. And now all we need to do is to reverse engineer this system and try to estimate what was the input in the first place. For that, we are going to use minimum mean square error estimator, uh, which is a widely used estimator in, in many fields, such as communication technologies. It is used to estimate the input in the presence of lots of uh, noisy outputs. Um, so the main insight here is that it allows us to incorporate the correlation and covariance values of the popularities uh, to determine the value of searching that topic uh, in internet. Uh, for example, if a particular topic has a lot of covariance uh, compared to different regions, uh, then this estimator uh, chooses this uh, topic as a valuable one that helps us uh, uh, explain how differentiating it can be to compare countries. So once we have this estimation, we multiply the scores with the internet access ratios, which is the probability of AR term in the equation that Chris just showed. And then we map all the scores between zero and one for the sake of easier comparability among different years. Uh, for the mathematical backgrounds of this operation, please refer to our paper. Okay, now we know how to process it, but what topics are we going to uh, import from Google? Uh, for that, we conducted a survey among the faculty in our department, and they have nominated lots of uh, important topics for computer science. We have chosen the most uh, popular ones that allows us to uh, have enough variance and covariance, uh, and we have analyzed those keywords. Okay, let's see how uh, this method uh, results. Um, for this, we first wanted to verify that our scores indeed uh, produced some uh, computer science literacy uh, uh, scores. For that, we compared our scores with the number of public GitHub repositories in the world. And the second proxy we used was the PISA math and science test scores of OECD countries. And the third one was that we conducted our own survey among random Google users around the world, and we asked them how many hours of computer science education do you have? So the table on the right shows the co uh, correlation values of those proxy measures and our scores. And you can see that indeed CSLI had positive correlation with all the proxies that we have. And as a side note, uh, during our investigations, we realized that uh, the PISA scores were also very pre uh, predictable by the GitHub repositories in, in that country. The main result with our work is that we are doing better every year. Uh, our scores are improving uh, and we hope that we can make it even better in the upcoming years. And when we disaggregate this uh, trend into continents, we see that uh, increase in continents as well. And for the full list of our scores, please refer to our GitHub repo. Um, the, the CSLI scores that we calculate allows also us to uh, create some clusters uh, in the world. And those clusters tends to be clusters that uh, where countries have similar curricular patterns. For example, the cluster on the top right corner has more systems and less AI uh, focus in their computer science uh, curricula. Or the cluster that has Australia and New Zealand has more threading and less finite state machines. 
And finally, the, the cluster that has United States has more AI focus in their curricula. So the, our scores are, uh, allow us to see this difference as well. Of course, there are some limitations to this work. The first one was that we have started with two assumptions in the beginning. So we need to challenge that for a more for future work. Uh, the second would be the demographics in each country. Uh, information seeking habits uh, might change uh, between different cultures. So it might be uh, interesting to uh, investigate that as well. And the final limitations we would like to uh, list here is the language of that country, especially for the alphabets that have non-Latin characters. Uh, it might be difficult for Google to um, classify queries into the correct topics. So that might uh, be a challenge for the data they are using. With that, go ahead, Chris. All right. Thanks, Serhat. So I'm just going to talk about some fun discussion things. Here's something that's been on all of our minds. How much education did we lose when the whole world went on to lockdown? So around uh, March 12th, basically many countries around the world decided to send all their kids home and how much education was lost. Well, I can't answer this for all different subjects, but now that Serhat has given us this language of CSLI from search, we can get a somehow noisy understanding of this project or, or of this, uh, how much was lost. So this is how you know, search volumes for computer science terms in previous years. And this is it in this year with COVID-19. And you can see that there was a pretty significant drop in people inquiring about computer science online. And we measure how big that drop is. It's about 1.7% of a year's search volume was lost in the three weeks from lockdown. That's substantial, but uh, not a catastrophe. Uh, of course, they could be very different for other fields. We've noticed that a lot of people decided to learn computer science because they were stuck at home in front of a computer. But it's certainly interesting. Um, and I believe I am missing. Ah, so another thing that we can look into are seasonal trends. And we found this very interesting uh, for climate change. We're really interested about climate change education. Uh, we can see how different concepts are learned in school versus out of school by looking how much there is a drop when there's a holiday in the country. Uh, so for things like greenhouse effect, there's a huge drop when there's a holiday in the country, but for other concepts like extinction, there's not that much of a drop. So we can figure out how scholastic each topic is. And similarly, we can look at when the peaks of each topic is. So we can start to figure out what is the order of concepts in a curriculum. So people tend to learn about global warming before fossil fuel, before sea level rise, before greenhouse effect, and before ocean acidification. And this is just hopefully inspiring you. you know, we've just scratched the surface, but there's all these really cool things that you could do. Uh, when you get access to the data, uh, we can look at temporal patterns, we can look at literacy indices, uh, the world's our oyster. Now, of course, we'd like to bring out this big point of caution. We were inspired to do this work because we want to include everybody in our measure of progress. Right now, when we talk about CS Project, we often talk about those who we can measure. And Sirhat, I, and Mo would love this to include more countries around the world. But of course, it's a double-edged sword because what we can know from search, we have to take it all with a grain of salt. The exciting, prog uh, exciting start to research, uh, but we really need to understand more about our systematic biases uh, as we get into this very cool source of signal. Sarhat and I, you know, we just think we're starting on a fun venture and we invite you guys all to join. And before we give it up to questions in the chat, I just want to put up a fun little connection. Sirhat and I do not know each other from Stanford. Actually, Sirhat and I met several years back uh, through a project that we talked about yesterday. There's this project called CS Bridge where we've been working with joining together with universities in different parts of the world. Uh, a few years ago, I went to Istanbul. I joined with a local professor uh, and Sirhat was a section leader who helped uh, teach a small group of students there. Uh, and so we met each other through this wonderful exchange across countries. Uh, and then I found out a year ago that we had the lucky honor of having Sirhat join us as a PhD student. And so we did this project together as a little celebration of the education work that we'd done. So Sarhat, welcome to the Learning at Scale community. Uh, everybody, thank you for your time.